In recent years, a silent revolution has taken place. We thought the age of fossil fuels was coming to an end, and we hoped we were heading for a future filled with renewable energy. But in Texas, deep in the heart of the old oil industry, a handful of men have caused a dramatic shift, putting the United States firmly back on the map as an oil and gas producing superpower. This breakthrough on shale turned out to be the biggest energy innovation so far of the 21st century. Thanks to the shale revolution, and with President Trump at the helm, the United States is headed straight for total energy independence. President Trump will fuel America's future and become the first president to achieve American energy independence. The shale revolution has opened up a huge reservoir of fossil energy. I'll say this, wherever there's oil fields, there's shale somewhere nearby that have not been drilled, and that's all over the world. But what exactly does the shale revolution entail? We shouldn't be exploiting any more fossil fuel gas because it's ruining our planet. This is Backlight. Welcome to Trumpland. Can I, can I have everybody's, a, can I have everybody's attention? The whole world is keeping close tabs on the state, where a few men in Texas are turning the energy supply industry on its head. Can I have everyone's attention? It might be worth saying a few things about what Mitchell did and uh, how it has impacted the world. And Dan Stewart was a team leader with Mitchell Energy, a small gas company that unleashed the shale revolution in the late 1990s. Once a year, the team gets together to celebrate their success at extracting gas from the Barnett Shale Rock Formation in northern Texas. Mitchell started the Barnett looking for something to save the company because we knew that our shallow reserves were decreasing and if we didn't have something to replace it, we were not, we were not gonna keep building reserves. Over half the oil that has been produced in the whole world was produced in the United States, mainly in the states of Texas, California. It looked as if the heyday of the US as an energy producing superpower had come to an end. In the previous few decades, America had become known chiefly as the biggest consumer of fossil energy. America is addicted to oil. The country had become more and more dependent on foreign oil and gas. On several occasions, this led to costly and radical military intervention, the consequences of which are still to be seen. If we hadn't proven the Barnett when we did, the price of natural gas would have gotten up to 20, probably $20 an MCF and would have destroyed our economy. The production of oil and gas in the US was dropping fast. George Mitchell was one of the many who needed to rescue their business. He had to find a new way of extracting gas and believed shale could be the way to go. So what Mitchell started turned into a world-changing supply of energy. And in my opinion, it was a gift from God. Deep below the face of this barren land in northern Texas lies the Barnett Shale Rock Formation. We're going to, the, uh, to visit a landowner and see the CW Slay number one, which was the first Barnett well that was ever fracked. And the landowner here is we're going to meet. Has, uh... In the late 1990s, Nick Steinsberger worked for Mitchell Energy as an engineer. It was he who discovered the crucial technique for extracting large volumes of gas from the shale. This sign with the Devon Energy sticker over top of it is the old Mitchell Energy sign. You can see it basically with the words here, Mitchell Energy Company. The sign is the CW Slay number two, which was one of the first wells drilled in this area. And the symbol of Mitchell Energy at the time was the mountains and the sun, which, which uh, s signified uh, energy for both the sun and mountains. Thanks to this so-called slick water fracking technique developed by Nick, this arid land became a gold mine. Hey. 
So I wanted to introduce you to a friend of mine, Carl Smith, is a friend of mine and a landowner in the Barnett Shale, and he's had some wells drilled on his property. How did it start when you, uh, the, the company approaches you or what? Yes, an agent from, from a, a company such as Devon or Exxon, whoever it is, will approach a, a mineral owner like myself and then uh, you negotiate a contract. They'll pay you per acre uh, of, on your land so much per acre to lease it. And then that, when they come out and make a location, they pay you damages. And also you negotiate on how much percentage you get from 20 to 25% of the revenue that the well produces. And in, in your situation, how do? 25%, yes. Mm -hmm. So you got 25% of? Uh, of the sale of all gas off of that well. So all, all proceeds, um, yeah. uh, 20, he gets 25% of all proceeds of, from, from the production of each well. Be before operation costs. Mm -hmm. You get yours off the top. It sounds like a lot. I'm not an expert, but so it, it sounds could be, like... It could be a whole lot, yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 Some people got very wealthy. I didn't happen to be one of them, but, <laughs> <laughs> but some of them we got, made lots and lots of money. Now this, I like to keep the oil around just so I can remember what it is I'm in the business for. Smell, I love the smell of uh, crude oil. You don't want to spend a lot of time smelling that, but it smells very sweet. Kent Bowker was the first to discover that the Barnet Shale Formation contained an astonishing amount of gas. This is the area where I thought Mitchell Energy should go in and start leasing land in anticipation of this becoming a huge oil and gas field. You can even see where I said where we should probably drill our first well. We drilled the well, we brought the rock up to the surface, I have a piece of a piece of it right here. We, we, this is a piece of Barnett shale. We bring it, we drill it, we bring it up to the surface, and when we bring this up to the surface, it was just bubbling, bubbling, huge volumes of gas. And I, and I looked at it, and I put some soapy water on it, and it just bubbles, bubbles, bubbles. And where's all that gas coming from? I mean, there's no holes in this that I can see. But there has to be holes because the gas has to be coming from someplace. So where? So that's where I thought, we, I need to understand this rock. I need to understand where's the gas coming from and how much is in there because there's a lot more gas than people realize. So far, the oil and gas industry had regarded shale as unexploitable. The rock was too hard and too impenetrable to extract gas from it in sufficient amounts. But Nick came up with a fracking technique that would change all that. The shales are, are so tight, are so, the rock is so dense that the, when you drill into them, the, the hydrocarbons or the oil or the gas will not come out of them until they are fracture stimulated. Okay, so what I have here is a, is a well bore. This is one string of casing to protect the surface groundwater and cement it up to the surface. And here's another string of casing, which is our producing casing. And then we pump fluid down the well bore and into, through those holes, mm. into, the, into the reservoir. And then when it goes through the reservoir, it creates lots of fractures in that, in that reservoir and that's what the gas molecules come through those fractures into the well bore and back up when it flows back up to the, up to the, um, up to the surface. And, and this is the, 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 the shale. So the shale rock. would be, yeah, the shale would be, you know, right here. Yeah. And the shale was actu actually considered like worthless by? By all of industry. So um, even uh, Mitchell Energy and others would drill down through the Barnett looking for other potential zones and they'd always see oil and gas from the Barnett, but they, they knew it was the source rock and it was hard to, it was gonna be hard to extract those hydrocarbons from, from the Barnett itself. And so they were looking more conventional plays where they could easily, more easily be, be um, produced. People thought we were absolutely nuts. We were crazy. 
One of my good friends at Mitchell said, Dan, I don't know what y'all are doing, but all this is just smoking mirrors. I think that what, what everybody had learned in school and what everybody had learned from experience is that, it, that shale could not work. Daniel Jurgen was a professor at Harvard. These days, he's a consultant for the international oil and gas industry. In that period of starting around 1998, uh, into the first couple of years of the 21st century, they broke the code and uh, liberated shale. This is the CW Slay number one, and this was the first well that was fracture stimulated in the Barnett Shale. And this is the wellhead so that the gas comes up and it goes underneath the ground to the back by my car over here, which is the separator and the production tanks. So 16 years ago, I fracked this well with the slick water frack. And then after that, um, this well has been sitting like this basically for the last um, many, many years. So without yeah, without any noise, without any interference, and it's just been sitting here producing for, for, for a very long time. I came to work at Mitchell at a time when Nick was figuring out how to decrease the cost of the stimulations of the frack jobs. So when I showed up, I said, hey, there's, a, there's four times more gas here than you guys know. And then Nick's figuring out a way to be able to stimulate the wells and drill the wells for half the cost. So we have four times the gas, we have half the cost, all of a sudden a miracle occurs. And then George Mitchell, he got the biggest smile on his face, leaned into the table, looked at us all. This is huge. This is the biggest secret the company we've ever had. No one can talk about this. He knew what it, what it meant when we told him how much gas was in the Barnett. He, wanted, he let loose the land teams. They went out and leased land all over the place. Areas that never had produced oil and gas in Texas, all of a sudden we're starting to see drill rigs, starting to see landmen, starting to see Mitchell come and drill wells. Because of the work and, and the discoveries we'd made in the Barnett, the field grew and grew and grew, got much bigger than we even thought at Mitchell, and became eventually the largest onshore gas field in the United States. I think when the shale revolution, even when it got going, if you had predicted the scale, the impact, and the rapidity with which it happened, you might have been committed to an insane asylum. People would just have said, this is not possible that it happened. So I think everybody who was involved and made it happen could not imagine once it got going, once this kind of entrepreneurial industry sort of assimilated how to do it, how fast it would happen, and it would not just end up being in Texas, it'd be in other parts of the country, in other parts of North America, including Canada. And now people, for instance, think the Marcellus region in Pennsylvania and the east part of the United States may be really the second largest gas field in the world. It looks as though fracking heralds a golden future for the American energy market. But there are major differences of opinion about the safety of the technique. It is said to pose several dangers to the environment, to cause earthquakes, and to contaminate the underground freshwater reserves. Do you understand the opposition right now to your work? I, frankly, I, they get upset. They get, want to know it's disruptive, it's going to pollute the environment. Everything we do pollutes the environment to some extent, but if we want cheap, reliable, clean burning fuel. It's natural gas is the way to go. And it, it's not nearly as bad as what people think. They fear that we're gonna cause earthquakes. We're gonna fear that we're gonna contaminate the groundwater and rightly so, but there's been hundreds of thousands of wells drilled and fracked in America and very, very few instances of water contamination. 
all in all, I think, I believe that the, the, the benefits far outweigh the risks. One of the unique things we have here is we have shale core stored here from lots and lots of wells throughout the nation. What we try to do is keep it kind of a secret because it's very, very valuable. Companies spend millions of dollars to get the secrets of the shales out of the ground. Geologist Ken Morgan manages the treasure chamber of the shale industry in a secret location somewhere in Dallas. Here at this laboratory, Shale rocks from all over the United States are stored for research. In this room is millions of dollars of rock, stacks and stacks of shale core all in boxes for observation and research. And now we're in our, our shale core viewing lab. What we have here is rock core or tubes of rocks that have been pulled out of the earth by the oil and gas companies. And we can see, we just unwrap these and the companies come in and look at these. They can spend as much time as they want to in here. And their purpose is to try to figure out where to drill. Top of the formation or the bottom of the formation? Maybe in the middle, but where is the hydrocarbons that they're after? If you take a look at this one, notice the big change that occurs right here. Above there, right there, is high organics, high oil and gas potential. Below that line, look how it changes. Much less carbon, much less hydrocarbon stored in the rock. So guess what? A geologist will see these changes and suggest to the company, stay in this part of the rock. This part will not produce the oil and gas we're looking for. So it's very critical about what rocks to drill into. You may have a drilling program that is 50 million, 500 million dollars of drilling operation. So this core may guide a tremendous amount of money that's gonna be used for drilling operations. Do you know any people that got very wealthy thanks to? Yeah. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. There was, a, there was a ranch down in South Texas called the Harrison Ranch that uh, Shell leased it for a billion dollars, just the lease. It was a... It was, billion dollars? It was, it was over 100,000 acres, and they paid him a billion dollars just, just for the opportunity to drill on their property. And then plus they shared in the revenue stream after that, so... Well, to put it in perspective, the ranch itself was not worth near <laughs> $1 billion. Not, not, uh, I mean, oh, yeah. maybe. Eight million, ten million dollars at the most. So, so to get a billion dollars just to drill on it, plus the revenue, this made people rich. I think that's one of the biggest reasons why the shale revolution was so uh, successful in the states. Whereas I'm not sure as how successful it will be other places because the landowners like Carl share in that wealth and make their ha if they make money they're happy and the oil and gas companies are happy if they make make money too. So it's a shared. It's a shared experience where in other countries that they don't own the minerals, they're not as happy about oil and gas companies coming onto their property and drilling and explore, exploiting their minerals and, and land. Shale has grown into an industry worth billions. The new generation of young entrepreneurs is barely interested in conventional oil and gas anymore. Scott, you mind if we borrow you for a second? Uh, this is, uh, we'll let our controller okay. out. I'll go back to the corner. <laughs> <laughs> this is our head of reservoir engineering. This is Scotty. You want to show him where the Barnett Shale is, Scott? This is the Barnett in North Texas. This is the Midland Basin, Delaware Basin. That's very, very attractive right now. This is the Eagleford, and then this is East Texas and the Haynesville Shale. And these guys, the names, like uh, they're just, color? They're just, you know, they were the guys in the 40s and 50s that pioneered a lot of the oil and gas yeah. companies in, in town. And perhaps in the future they have a different map with... Matt, uh, maybe Matt, Matt's face on Matt it, not mine. Spot, uh, <laughs> on it. <laughs> so it's, uh, the trick is making money. That's, that's the real trick. 
The big bucks are now to be made in shale. This is Adam Griffin. Hi. He's our head of land, our vice president of land. Nice to meet you guys. Matt Miller is one of the modern oil and gas entrepreneurs. He runs an investment company in downtown Dallas that focuses exclusively on shale. I think that shale has decreased the risk of finding oil and gas per well. You know, if you think of oversimplifying here, but if you think of conventional oil and gas as there's a, there's a bubble of oil in the ground, I'm gonna stick a straw in and try to pop that bubble. Whereas unconventional or shale gas is, I'm gonna drill down into tight rock, I'm gonna fracture that rock, and that'll allow those hydrocarbons to flow out of that rock and up the wellbore. What that's done is it's made a much lower risk profile to find oil and gas. It's made dry holes something of a past for the industry. It, it tends to be a lower risk proposition. Uh, there's more capital going into shale. Usually whenever there's more capital, that means that there's more jobs that are associated with shale exploration. Therefore, there's more opportunity as a young person to get one of those entry level jobs. Yeah. Uh, that tends to be the, the cycle that we're seeing right now. So it, it creates hundreds of thousands of jobs. Uh, it's, it's a very, very capital intensive industry. And how about the revenue? Yeah, we hope it's revenue intensive as well. <laughs> the impact of the shale revolution has really been enormous, not only for the U.S. energy industry, but for the U.S. economy. We had at our conference in Houston in early 2014, Ben Bernanke, who had been the chairman of the Federal Reserve, he just stepped down. And I said to him, what's the impact of this shale revolution on the overall economy? And he said, it's one of the most positive things that's happened to our economy since the financial collapse of 2008. Then he paused and said, maybe the most positive. So it had a many positive effects that just were not anticipated. In the case of gas, and then in the case of oil, once it started unfolding, it unfolded a lot faster than people thought and turned out to be a lot bigger. Basically, after Mitchell and other companies learned what to do with these gas shells and these tight gas sands and limestones, then people started looking at oil and saying, well, you know, we think we can apply this same understanding and te technology to some of these rocks out there that have oil in them. And pretty soon, we are very close to surpassing our previous peak oil. The U.S. supply just kept increasing at a faster and faster rate, and the, you had a world oil market that was oversupplied. And in November of 2014, OPEC, really led by the Saudis, just decided that if they cut back, all they were gonna do was keep prices high and make more room for the United States, make more room for Russia, make more room for other countries. And they said, we're not gonna do that anymore. And then the price began to collapse and it collapsed a lot more than people thought. We glutted the gas market first, then we glutted the oil market to the point that we interfered with OPEC's profits. When we interfered with OPEC's profits, they said, well, we've gotta, we gotta shut this down we were taking away some of their customers. So they decided they had, to, they had to basically go to war with U.S. operators at, at, for survival's sake. Uh, and so they started uh, pumping out a lot more oil and dropping the price. The idea was shale production, oil shale or shale oil production is very expensive U.S. producers will, will not be able to drill any wells at these prices. Production declines very quickly out of these fields, and therefore all we have to do is wait around a couple years. We can outlast the U.S. producers. They're going to they're gonna suffer. Prices then will come back up because U.S. shale production will drop, and it didn't happen. For the industry, there's a pro and there's a con, okay? The con is, yes, a lot of people lost jobs. And I hate that. I hate that. Um, a lot of companies went bankrupt. I hate that. But 
the, our country, our country gained from this because the companies that didn't go out of business figured out cheaper ways to get more reserves in order to combat the lower OPEC price. And, and that's, that's the problem. Once the cat was out of the bag, once we figured out that we could get this oil and gas out, then it's just a matter of how do you get it out better. The price war started by OPEC caused a survival of the fittest scenario. Only the shale producers who learned to extract more efficiently and more cheaply using innovative techniques managed to survive. They became the heroes of the industry. This is Trinidad rig number 433. We are in West Texas in Midland County. This is drilling a vertical Wolfberry well to 11,400 feet. We are on day number seven right now and they're 9,000 foot deep. We're going to be going to 11,500 foot deep. And you're drilling into shale rock we, formation? We, we are drilling into shale and it's shale, sandstone and carbon. It's three separate types of rocks. These wells typically take about nine days to drill. We can move this entire operation in 12 hours. And so they'll be moving in three days, approximately. When we go to move, we will tear all of this down, move it to another location and uh, rig everything up and start drilling the next well. That entire operation takes about 12 hours. It's extremely efficient how quickly we can tear this down and move it. When we move the drilling rig off, then a crew will come on and fracture the well, and that's gonna take about three days. And uh, after the frack crew leaves, we'll put a pumping unit on the well, and we'll start flowing oil and gas. Fascan Oil and Ranch, based in Western Texas, survived the price war and is now one of the leading shale producers. Thanks to innovation, they're currently getting oil out of the ground at a much lower price. When we first started drilling these wells back in 2008, they were 20 to 22 days, okay? And then when we did the partnership with Trinidad, we, got, we first started drilling in 14 days. And then as Corey come on, and the bit technology got better, and the motor technology, and, and these hands got better and more efficient, we've gotten them down to eight days sometimes. That is phenomenal. And, and it has to do with the technology we use. I think that OPEC strategy is a failing one in that OPEC underestimated the resilience of United States oil and gas producers to get oil and gas out of the ground at a lower cost. And I think they also underestimated the efficiency of the U.S. capital system. One of the things that benefited our industry uh, uh, greatly is the ability to restructure debt very quickly. About $66 billion of EMP firms went bankrupt. About 85% of those dollars restructured. The companies didn't liquidate, the companies didn't evaporate. They emerged with a different structure to their balance sheet. So the oil and gas still comes out of the ground, but you don't owe the bank money, you just own a restructured entity. So the US bankruptcy code allowed us to fight the OPEC fight in a much more efficient way over the years. OPEC is an organization of 14 oil exporting countries. It is often regarded as a cartel because it can influence prices by increasing or decreasing the oil supply. For many decades, OPEC dominated the oil market, but it looks like the shale revolution will put an end to that. The uh, agreement that OPEC reduces approximately 1.2 million barrel a day to bring its ceiling to 32.5 million barrel per day, effective first of January to 2017. Thank you very much for coming. And After two years of trying to push the shale producers out of the market, OPEC threw in the towel last November. The cartel decided to reduce production in order to get the oil price up again. 
when the price got really low, the OPEC countries were really hurting because they need $50 a barrel or $60 a barrel to support their countries. They're going in debt supporting their countries at prices lower than that. Where a low price for us, it hurts the oil companies, but as a country, we're still doing fine. We have all kinds of other industries, right? So that's the difference. What happened is that we just outlasted Saudi Arabia. They can't take the pain anymore of their debt. And so they've decided to cut production. And, and so now the price comes up to 50. I, I think all the, the companies in the Permian Basin can make good money at $50 oil. Yeah, if you think about the break-even price for shale, on a just blended basis across the United States. Prior to the collapse, you might have thought about it as being $80 per barrel. Post-collapse, again, well cost to drill go down. Post-collapse, that break-even cost is around $55 a barrel. If I'm OPEC, I've repriced my barrels in the ground from $80 to $55, really without harming the United States oil and gas industry all that much. Um, I don't think it was a good strategy. It's gotten cheaper. We're getting more oil out of the wells for less cost. And so that's where we're at. 10 years from now, I don't know. Maybe, maybe we'll be able to produce it at $30 a barrel. Everybody in the US. It just depends on how much we can recover and how good we get at that recovery. But it's a tremendous thing for United States of America to have this play. It, it's changed the whole political structure of the world, what's happening right here. The addition of U.S. shale has certainly shifted away from an OPEC-dominated world oil market to a much more competitive oil market, and that's been driven by uh, this uh, amazing increase in U.S. production. I think it's now recognized that it's part of the mix. I think it's also recognized that it's not high cost oil, it's medium cost oil. And there are other oil supplies that are higher cost around the world. And so it's a recognition that shale is gonna be part of the mix, it's not going away. Now, one of the big questions we have about who would want to come and visit here? Well, from all over the world, from China, Japan, South America, Middle East, all over Europe, you name the country in the last couple, three years, they visited in here to see what this is all about and do they have the potential for it. I'll say this, wherever there's oil fields, there's shales somewhere nearby that have not been drilled and that's all over the world. So we see a really big future for shale being able to deliver oil and gas. So all the Middle East oil fields are conventional sands and limestones that produce oil. Guess what's underneath those gigantic oil fields in Saudi Arabia? Shales that have never been drilled, that are untapped, that will be decades and decades of potential production into the future. Shale, gas and oil has introduced even more fossil fuels onto our energy market. This abundance of cheap fossil fuels now threatens to price renewable energy out of the market. Many people wonder how it will affect our efforts towards a sustainable future. What in the United States, what low-cost gas has done is really pushed coal and taken market share away from coal. Coal used to be more than 50% of electric generation not so long ago. Now it's under 30% and gas actually has a, has a bigger share. So, you know, I think we, you know, there's a long-term energy transition happening. I think it's gonna unfold over many decades, not over many years, but renewables will become progressively more important. I think natural gas plays a particularly important role as a partner of renewables because renewables are intermittent. The classic thing is the sun doesn't shine all the time, the wind doesn't blow all the time, and so gas is a, an important part of the mix. Shale gas as the ideal partner for renewable energy 
That's one way of looking at it, according to the Americans. And as they now have an abundance of gas thanks to the shale revolution, they present themselves as the new energy superpower on the world stage. This facility started as the, with the idea that the U.S. was going to be short of gas. And so the decision was made to build an import facility. So we built the, the import facility. It was started up in 2008, 2009, right when the shale revolution started. And so since then, the facility hadn't operated. And as the shale revolution kicked off in 2010, we actually announced that we were going to export gas. And so we undertook building the export facility that you see behind me. So this actually was an, uh, a facility to import gas to the United States? Correct. And now what we've done is we've turned it around to export gas to the rest of the world from the United States. In terms of oil, it's very similar that uh, the U.S., in just a period of a little more than half a decade, almost doubled its oil production, and people started saying that the U.S. was going to overtake Russia and Saudi Arabia to be the largest producer of oil in the world. And now when you think of world oil, you have to think of the big three, Saudi Arabia, Russia, and the United States. Our cargoes have been exported all over the world. South America, Southeast Asia, Europe, the Middle East. How come the Middle East needs the U.S. shale gas? They're actually building import terminals in several countries in the Middle East. And so, you know, our production and our price matches up with their needs. But isn't it ironic that, that uh, the U.S. is exporting gas to the Middle East? Yes, it is actually. We've, this month, the U.S. has actually become a, a net exporter of energy due to the fact that we've had the shale revolution and we're able to export LNG. The first uh, imports of U.S. oil from the Middle East uh, was from Kuwait uh, in around 1948, and now his, it's just a turnaround. The U.S. will actually be among the exporters of natural gas to Kuwait. And that, you know, if you sort of think about it, it really shocks the mind. What does this mean for the old school oil producers? The main oil exporting countries are increasingly worried about the United States as an energy superpower. We're still seeing the unfolding geopolitical impact of the shale revolution. Middle East countries express concern that uh, the U.S. will be less interested in the Middle East because it will be importing a lot less oil. And I think that there's a, a sense that this enhances the autonomy and the position of the U.S. The fact that we are less dependent on foreign oil is great for the United States. You know, we were, we were importing probably 60%, maybe a little more than that. Now, now we're only importing less than half. And, and we have the potential to further reduce that. And, and I, I, you know, I don't know if the United States will be energy independent, but certainly North America could be energy independent with the Canadians and the Mexicans. That whole region, we could produce what we use. I think the shale revolution and its impact on prices has uh, not only hit the budgets of oil exporting countries, of petro states, but has also hit the very conception of how these states work and their over-dependence on oil revenues and the fact that they set their budgets at high prices and expenditures and then they have to cut them. And I think what it's done is sent a very powerful message about diversifying economies and managing your oil revenues differently so you're not vulnerable to cycles. Because I think the oil exporting countries became accustomed to high prices and assumed the high prices would go on forever and they based their budgets and spending on that and then reality delivered a very powerful shock with which they're still dealing. 
In Saudi Arabia, they spend, they have oil. That's, that's their economy. And it supports their whole nation. In America, in the United States, we have lots of economies, okay? And, and they all support, so we're diversified. That's a good thing. That's a good thing for your country because now you have two sources for gas. So if you just have one, that guy's in total control, right? He's not in total control anymore. That's a good thing. That's a good thing for your country. You're not totally dependent on Putin now, right? If we can export to you, then, then he's going to try to come to the table and say, hey, I, I'm not going to really cut that gas off this winter like I did before, because I know you can get it from the U.S. From Europe's point of view, to have competition between Russian gas and U.S. natural gas, first of all, is valuable from an economic point of view because it means more competition, but it's also valuable because it gives diversification of resources and that gives resilience uh, to the energy system, particularly at a time when Europe's own gas, preeminently from Groningen among others, is going down, uh, Europe's gonna need to import more gas and it's wise to import it from a number of different suppliers. The gas reserves in the Netherlands are diminishing fast. Shale gas seemed a good solution, but it has met with a lot of resistance. Ja, nou, het is net als het ons door de strot willen duwen. Dat gevoel heb ik er nu bij. Dat die bodemgesteldheid is hier geweldig en die laten we niet verpesten door door een paar jaar van die schaliegasboringen hier toe te staan. Ja, maar als we nu zeggen Groningen niet en we willen we willen geen schaliegas en we willen Russisch gas niet en we willen Noordzeegas niet, waar moet ik het gas dan vandaan halen? The Dutch government has decided to ban shale drilling for now. In the United Kingdom, however, they think it has great possibilities. Various companies are trying to convince people that it's the path to follow. INEOS is one of these British companies. They hired the Texan pioneers as consultants, hoping to copy America's success in the UK. Beneath the surface of the United Kingdom lie huge shale gas deposits. The British government thinks this gas could transform UK industry, making the country energy independent and creating tens of thousands of new jobs in manufacturing. The British government wants to develop shale not only because it needs additional natural gas, but also because it sees the economic benefits for its industry, for its competitiveness, for job creation. Uh, but it's run into a lot of environmental opposition, and so, uh, you know, not much has happened in the UK despite the determination of the government to go ahead. The locals firmly oppose the initiative. One of the main reasons being that fracking in the Texan prairies is in no way similar to fracking in a densely populated Europe. A protest has been held in Sherwood Forest against plans to survey for shale gas. Exploration is at an early stage, still in negotiations, but there are fears in the long term it could see fracking of land under or adjacent to the ancient woodland. They need to do the seismic surveys before they can find out um, where it's safe to frack, and we're saying it's not safe to frack in this area. I'd prefer we were putting money into renewables. We shouldn't be exploiting any more fossil fuel gas because it's ruining our planet. The shale revolution threatens to revive the use of fossil energy. How will this affect all our efforts towards a future based on renewable energy? Because of this abundance of gas and oil created by the shale revolution, now the incentive to invest in, in renewable energy uh, will uh, go away. How do you look at this? At this? I think it is a bridge fuel. I don't think we're going to be living off a, a deriving energy from natural gas forever and ever. I think eventually we are going to reach a point where re the technology is there, where renewables are economically viable. What we've seen in the last decade is that the costs have gone down a lot and the scale has increased and so renewables are clearly going to have a growing share of the energy mix in the years ahead. 
I think renewables have made a lot of progress and they'll continue to make progress. Technology advances forward. It's going to eventually get to the point where the, ba the battery systems that we have, the transmission systems, the generation systems, either with solar or wind, get to the point where at a price point they can compete with natural gas. And at that point, gas will fade away and renewables will come in. Never bet against technology. We're gonna come up with better storage systems, better generation systems, just the same way technology started the shale revolution. Ultimately, the lowest cost provider wins. And you need, you need to be comfortable and agnostic about that. If, if, if wind or solar beats out a natural gas power plant, you're, it doesn't matter how much government regulation or Trump helps or anything along those lines, you're gonna lose. Economics wins. The shale revolution has upset the balance of energy relations across the globe. If the political wind changes following Donald Trump and Brexit, many countries could soon be tempted by the potential economic benefits of shale exploitation. Thank you for watching. For more on this subject, take a look at the playlist. You can also watch this recommended video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel and we'll keep you updated on our documentaries.